Harry Kitten and Tucker Mouse by George Selden. Pictures by Garth Williams. Read for you by Stuart Heyman. At least I can have a name, the tiny mouse said to himself. He was picking his way very carefully along the gutter of 10th Avenue in New York City. Whish! Just like that, he dart from under one parked one parked car to the dark, dirty safe beneath under, beneath another. For this young little mouse, he, he found the, the, the human beings didn't like him much. Some of those two-legged creatures who thought they owned the whole city called him a rat, which he definitely was not. When they saw him, and then called him a rodent, and that one just said, YICK! Which sounded mo most unkind of all. But at least I can have a name, the mouse said. As he paused to nibble the crust of a cheese sandwich that one of the human beings had thrown away, he wished that there had been more cheese and less crust. My own name, he quickly hid behind a, tr a, a tire, my, er, as threatening a leather boot, boot came near. It could be Hamlet, Hamlet Mouse. The night before, in the theater district, the young mouse had heard two human beings, very well dressed, say they don't. They were going to a show called Hamlet. But I don't like Hamlet, the mouse said to myself. It sounds too much like a little pig. There was another possibility: Godzilla Mouse. Two teenage boys, teenage boys were going to, the, to were going to a horror movie, and the mouse overheard them talking. Godzilla Mouse. It just wasn't me, he decided. But who it was he? If he didn't have a name, he wouldn't be anyone else, anyone. For a name makes a person very special. He is himself and no one else. A group of young girls walked by the car which under which the mouse was hiding. The, these laughing young girls, one of them had soft, fuzzy hair and a high, sweet voice, reminded the mouse of the very first thing he could remember. That was a nest made of scrapes of cloth and thrown away in Kleenexes and other comfortable, cozy odds and ends. And there was also, also a soft, warm, furry weight. The word mother ran his ears that tried to protect him from pounding shovels and nasty words and the, th and the threat of death. There were men in uniforms, sanitation workers, and he ran. He ran. The young mouse, the young mouse had, and still was running. Since then, there had been no warmth, no weight, no comforting covering. There had only been darting from one part of the car, a temporary refuge to another. But I don't. Ha but I have to have a name. The mouse said. So even if I do get trumped on, at least I know who's who's being squashed. The motor of the car he was under started up with a roar. The mouse jumped aside. His jump landed him very near those girls. And in order not to frighten them, became, became, because young girls and, and the mice sometimes do not get along, he hid between the two garbage cans. Not a very nice place, to be sure, but a little, the little mouse had, had been in worse. And also he was near enough to hear the girls talking. A rippling, happy sound. I'm hungry, said one. So am I, said another. Well, this is the best bakery in the 10th Avenue, said the third girl. Mary Tucker's home baked goods. Does anyone feel like a glazed donut or raspberry tart? They're to die over. They're so good. The girls twirled their excitement and went into the bakery. And oh, a glazed donut, a raspberry tart. The little mouse whose mouth was now watering could have, have died over either one. But something even more testering echoed in his ears. Mary Tucker's home baked goods. He felt there was something special in those words. A name. It can't be Mary, he said to himself. Sounds too much like Mary. And if you were growing up to grow up and be a he mouse, well, a name like Mary would just not do. But Tucker, he mused and repeated the name Tucker Mouse. It sounded quite original. Not ordinary like Tom or Joe or Bill. Tucker Mouse, he shouted. That's me. This name tasted more sweet and more strong in his mouth than a raspberry tart. So, armed with his name, the mouse marched through the gutter. It's true, but 
He marched down 10th Avenue. His name, Tucker Mouse, which he looked for, for so long, gave him strength, courage, gave him life. Tucker Mouse skidded after the girls, darting those close to the, to the buildings that lined the street. He was hoping that one of the girls might drop a little piece of pastry, but sadly, they, they all liked tarts and donuts as much as he did. It's back in their lips, which made it worse. None of them, not one of them, dropped a single clump, crumb. Then, up ahead, he saw what he feared most of all in the world. A garbage truck, and all around it, sanitation workers scooping up trash on the sidewalk. Tucker Mouse knew that the uniformed un uniform men thought he was trash, too. He felt lonely and afraid again. And tired. So tired. He had to find a place to rest. A narrow, dark alley. As Tucker was scooching in, he happened to see a small Cooper coin on the sidewalk. He, insignificantly, he snatched it up in his two front paws, then vanished into the sheltering dark. A penny! He exclaimed out loud, quite proud that he found it and saved it. The humans begin, begin be, beings think pennies are good luck, said a voice behind him. Tucker rolled around, and the dirt behind him, nibbling a crust, the remains of a sandwich. He saw a kitten. His first thought was, poor guy, he's as starved as I am. But then he remembered, I'm a mouse, and this is a kitten who would really likely be a, become a cat. You want to fight? He demanded. Why? The kitten put down his crust and simply asked, why? Well, well, Tucker Mouse was flustered. It's just that, well, cats and mice fight, that's all. But why? The kitten continued in question. I was starving to death before I found this pitiful piece of sandwich. Some overfired human being missed to that garbage can. So I got to eat. And you don't look too biffy yourself, so why make life worse for each other by fighting? Tucker Mouse was somewhat taken back. He hadn't expected such reasonable talk from a skinny kitten and say next to a trash can and a decaying pumpkin. But what do we do if we don't fight? asked Tucker. Mmm, the kitten the kitten purred softly like a philosopher. But you could just be friends. What? Not so loud. The human beings are all around. Tucker nodded ruefully. They were surrounded. I know it's unusual, said the kitten. At least I know it's I know it's supposed to be, but this is New York, and all the rules are broken here. For the best, I hope we might even set a pretendent. What's a pretendent? It's a new way of thinking, said the kitten, and a new way of feeling too. You promise not to eat me? I'll ne I will never be that hungry. The kitten patted the small mouse's head. And even if I was, I couldn't. My teeth are aren't big enough yet. Hmm. The mouse had to think about that. For a mouse to trust a cat? You've got to trust somebody sooner or later, the kitten declared. Why not try me? Well, okay, for a while, but I'm keeping an eye on those teeth. Tucker sighed and looked down to the alley, where some sanitation workers were doing their job. For a moment, he even wished them well. They had problems, too. He thought to, to himself, but I hope I can, I'm, not, I'm not one of them. You want some sandwich? Tucker Mouse said nothing. Come on, urged the kitten. It's ham and cheese. Mice like cheese. Ooh, Tucker grumbled grum with delight. Then just do much, much of this piece. See, there is ham and also cheese on this crust. I am sort of hungry, admitted Tuckler. But it isn't a raspberry tart. Well, listen to the mouse kittens, the kitten furred. <sighs> Next time I'll try to supply, don't you dare call me mouse kittens. Beef steak or corned beef? Oh, can I bite? said the mouse. I'm so hungry, you can't believe. It's all yours, said the kitten. I'm full. Full? The thought of being full of food had never occurred to the mouse before. Munch out, said the kitten, and Tucker munched. Between mouthfuls, for there is more than to a crust than a human being might think, he asked. He asked, what's your name? And then, before the kitten could answer, he, ex he explained, between munches, why his name was Tucker. 
Well, that's very much like it's exactly what happened to me, said the kitten. And friendship like a frail tree grew between them. I too, said the kitten, was hiding from everybody. I wanted to be invisible, the kitten sighed. Although I had always felt like it was, well, you know, special. Me too, said Yucker. But then two kids walked by. The kitten's voice brightened. And a and one had an arm around the the, the other's shoulders. <clears throat> These two nice guys were just talking like friends. The kitten purred at the memory. And then the woman with the scraggly blonde hair said, Harry, you're a character. The kitten's eyes blazed in memory. Harry, you're a character, the kid said. So I knew that my name that, that was my name, said the kitten. Since I've always wanted to be a character, and a character's name is Harry. The kitten fell silent, except for a purr, which sounded Tucker's invented intention like loyalty and maybe trust. So I'm Harry, said the kitten. And I am Tucker, said the mouse. A thoughtful silence grew long and then longer between them. The outs, but outside the private silence they shared were taxis honking, huge trucks roaring, and din and danger of New York. So, where do we go from here? asked the mouse, with a tremble in his voice that he tried hard to hide. Harry thought a moment and then explained, Oh, I know where. There's a great building, and it must have lots and lots of cellars where we'd be safe. Follow me. He began to crep, creep really down the street. It was evening now, and he and his friend could slip through of the failing light like ghosts. Wait, wait, shouted Tucker. I have to hide my penny. When I can, I'm, I'm going to come back and get it. There was a kin, kin leg nearby, and the mouse thought of shoving it under one wheel. It had been parked there a very long time. The meter said so, but the little mouse reconsidered. If it had been there so long, the police would probably be keep coming soon and drag away to the plate to the place where cars went to jail until their owners came to claim them. Every mouse should let this have his life savings, and this penny is the beginning of mine. He decided finally, after having so much scuttling back and forth, that it just might be safe what's between in the two bricks. In the tenant wall face the alley. Now don't let me forget where I put it. I'll have a suspicion you'll never forget, said the kitten. But by now, he began to form an idea of his friend's character. It was no, not greedy, but rather... acquisive. Which is much the same thing, but, not, but in much nicer terms. I'm ready, Tucker Mouse announced. Now where? To the deep and mysterious lower levels of the great, greatest building in all the world, said the kitten. The fantastic and fabulous Empire State Building. Oh, mumbled Tucker. I never heard of it. Harry made a face which looked like a like pity or maybe disbelief. Even the meekest mouse, he said, must surely have heard of the Empire State. Why well, haven't? said Tucker. So show me. An hour scurrying, hurrying, worrying, and then it rose above them, beautiful and unbelievable. They really do know something, said Tucker. The human beings. He looked up. Up. Just look at that. Let's see what's underground, said Harry Kitten. He, I heard about those cellars ever since I could, I could remember. And when is that? asked Tucker, with a hush, hu uh, uh, hush in his voice. I don't know, said Harry. The first thing, the really fir very first thing I remember is shivering. Last month, in a pipe, of, in a pipe of, of iron, there was some cat there, little, like me, with black and white fur. Then I forget. But maybe I have brothers and sisters somewhere. Show me the building, said so Tucker Mouse. He coughed, because Harry seemed to be dreaming and sad, and Tucker had to interrupt. And tell me about, and show me all the fantastic fabulous fa cellars underground. Please, Harry, even if they're scary. Okay, said Harry. His voice was still dull. But I don't know about the world levels. Come on, said Tucker. Let's adventure. We have to go down and down and down, said Harry. The kitten and the mouse prowled carefully around the huge building. And in back they found a freight, a freight elevator on the street level that they hadn't completely closed. Like two furry quick blinks and they almost were invisible. They dashed through. 
It was 8 o'clock, and most of the weary human be beings had, gratefully, gone home. We're in luck, said Harry. We can prowl at our rent leisure. They jumped down to the floor below, a dark passageway, barely lit by, by a series of weak white bulbs, screeched endlessly ahead of them. We may need a, a hunk of that stuff, Luck, said Tucker, <coughs> starting into the gloom. I wish I had my penny. Oh, we'll be lucky, said the Harry the jauntily. As you said before, let's do some exploring. Adventuring. The stairway is some marked, some marked emergency exit. The air shafts, the endless, endless corridors. No one could scribble. The lower levels of the Empire State Building. At one point, outside a closed elevator door, Tucker had to stand on Harry's shoulders, even with the help of a nearby ladder, to push the button with an arrow and that pointed down. I suppose that's us, said the mouse. As he weaved and wobbled dangerously, and finally managed to push that button in. There! The door opened, and they entered. Nobody there. And the elevator began to descend, and descend, and descend. <coughs> Harry, we're coming out oh, in China. No, we're not. Just wait. The kitten sounded very sure for someone who wasn't all that sure. At last, the elevator stopped. The door opened. Out they ran. You see, Mousekins, I asked you not the lowest level. That's where, that's where the, that's what the elevator button says. We're here. And get off my shoulders, by the way. The lowest level, Muse took a mouse. To think that it should come to this. Fewer human be begins to work, begins beans work to worry us. Harry offered his jaunty suggestion as hope. Anyway, we're here. Here? Here was a tunnel... Of, with white tiles for a floor and white tiles for a ceiling and also white tiles for walls. Here, in fact, was all white tiles. Not even a sanitation inspector in sight. There's absolutely no one around, the kitten went on. So I noticed, said, said Tucker, eyeing the ice white canyon they were in. A ghost would make this place feel alive. Now, now. Now what? Screamed Tucker Mouse. We're on the bottomless level and it feels like it looks like Dead Man's Gulch. At that, at the very worst, said Harry, there's nobody here. That's just it. Nobody. Who'd want to do us, who'd want to do us any harm? At this point, said Tucker, the chance of a little harm might be quite exciting. Shall we take the elevator back up, in, up to level four? Asked Harry. There may be janitors there. Let's try here for a while. Sir while, said Tucker. For, for hours, these two, a kitten who wanted to seem very brave and a mouse who was afraid to admit he was scared, roamed through the labyrinth, the labyrinth that lies far beneath the Empire State Building. Now and then, they caught sight of men in uniform, the caretakers for the other building, who roamed about doing the odd jobs for a building who is like a living thing. It needs to be taken care of. That night, there were only a few lonely men, and they were quite easy to avoid. The solitude, however, the silence and the isolation, they were not so easy to avoid, but still, no one even knew the kitten and the mouse were there. Food was no problem. The caretakers were very careless, they left little bits of lunches around, a shred of lettuce, a bit of bread, now and then a glob of yogurt in a container. But lettuce and bread, and even drinks of old milkshakes, are, very, are really very dull if you have too much of them. I'd love a hunk of cheese, said, said Tucker. Mm, um, purred Harry, roast beef for me. The next day came up above. Of course, deep down, they couldn't tell day from night. Tucker looked around, scratched one ear, and said, Harry, have you been in this particular corridor before? I don't know, said Harry. They all look alike. Precisely, said Tucker. That means we are, don't say it, lost? Neither said a word. Then Tucker remembered. You know, 10th Avenue wasn't dull. It was very lively, in fact. Especially when the sanitation workers were trying to bash you with shovels, said Harry. We gotta get out of here, shoveled tu shouted Tucker. I'm going out of my mind. I agree, said Harry Stein. The Empire State Building, beautiful as it is, is not the place for us. But we're lost, shrieked Tucker, and there's no ladder here, even if we could find an elevator. 
There is no more pitiful. There is no more fearful sight than young mouse wailing his paws. Now just you wait," said Harry Kitten. And for a kitten, he had learned to speak with a quite a bit of authority. I've seen something you have not. You've seen. Took her mouse. Talked loudest. But her Harry only purred the truth. What? What? I have seen a chalk mark on the wall. Harry, with one paw, pointed to a slender line of chalk that ran along one wall. We are not the only souls who have been alone down there. One human being was also afraid to get lost, and he'll show us the way out. He will? Tucker, Tucker, Tucker couldn't believe his ears. He was scared too, but he had a piece of chalk. And we, if we followed the line he made to find his way out. Let's go, yelled Tucker. Whoever you are, you human being, please save us too. We are only animals. And the chalk line scribbled on the wall led Tucker and Harry as they had that man to the street. The man's name was Matthew. He lived in Queens, which is part of New York, and he had four sons. The night he drew, and the night he drew the chalk line, so he know where he had been already that night was Halloween, and it was on duty. A lucky accident. Two years later, for a kitten and a mouse. The street. He took a, he took a mouse inside. Oh, the street. He was just about to feel the relief when watch out, Lord Henry, said Harry. Here comes the garbage truck. We gotta run. Follow me, shouted Tucker. Follow you? I got brains too. Me little ones. But when I get when I was on 10th, 10th Avenue, just trying to stay alive, I heard some kids say they were going down to the docks to get a, a suntan. The docks? Puff Harry. He had run to keep up with his friend. With all those ocean liners? Not those docks, said Tucker. Down the lower part of New York, there are old abandoned piers. Where people get suntans if they get their if they take their shirt off. Off old abandoned piers? Yes, very run down, so safe for us. Mmm. Harry Kitten choked as he ran. I don't quite like the sound of that. Furtively in the late afternoon, the kitten and the mouse made their way to the docks. And if Harry Kitten didn't like those words, old abandoned piers, he liked the old abandoned piers themselves much less. Yes, it was sunset. And even in their dangerous ruins, the docks, the day the decaying piers of New York seemed almost beautiful. Red and orange light illuminated illuminated the fallen roofs, the leaning walls, and the everlasting sun in the west seemed to bless the place. Behind the two friends as they sat on the pier, the lights of New York were flickering not on as they danced to the great flowing river seemed like a blessing, but nothing blessed the inhabitants of those piers. There are rats here, whispered Tucker. Well, you're a- I'm a ruinant. I guess I'm not rats, not me. I s he slipped out his fur and gave Harry a appealing smile. We must have style. Then he groaned ferociously, and rats have none. No style, no niceness, no nothing. The bums. Tucker looked around. There are human beings here, too. Look at that guy over lying over there, asleep. Poor soul, murmured Harry. I hate to see a human being so down to his luck. They had to find a place of their own, too. I agree, Tucker nodded suspiciously. Sympathetically. I also hate to think of a certain kitten I know, and also mouths who are so far down on, on their luck that they had to live here. Yak! The yak burst out a, a frantic cockroach. Heaven knows where he was going, that he had just across Tucker's left paw. We'll stay here tonight. And then, watch out! A crunching, tearing sound came from the ceiling of the pier where they were. Harry yanked Tucker's mouse aside, and a huge stuck of plaster fell just where they had been sitting. If we if we live through the night, said Tucker, wipe the pl pl plaster off, dust off his fur. Over here, said Harry. A huge grinder had fallen from the roof. There was an open space beneath it. Get under here. Then even if more of the roof comes down, we'll be safe. The two animals crawl beneath the beams. Safe, said Tucker. I've been giving up on being safe. Even these little kids with their nice suntans will probably throw rocks at us tomorrow. Well, don't give up on being safe. Rocks and falling beam were not, said Harry. 
He curled up into, into, and into a few minutes of whizzing, purring, zizzing sound told Tucker in, that he was asleep. And after 50 minutes, so was Mouse. His first dream was, was about those cheeseburgers. Next morning, at that very same moment, the two woke up as if the, the clocks inside their heads were exactly the same. They were that close. Dawn gloried over the east. The sight made the great buildings of Manhattan look as if they were dreams. Such great dreams. I'm hungry, Tucker yawned. We got no food. Oh, Tucker men. Then what now? I don't know. And for the first time, Tucker heard, and not a whimper, but a fearful tone in Harry's voice. Come on, Harry, said Tucker Mouse. If we have to go on looking, we go. At that day and night, with, 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 with hurrying, scurrying, worrying, the mouse and the kitten made their way uptown. It made hiding behind fire plugs and allies under cars. And it's like only old lonely life it was. Next morning, just at first light, gold streamed from the east. Harry said, I see green. Look, ahead of them were trees, shrubs, clipped hedges, a glow in the dawn. We have to rest here, said Harry. Heaving sighs to relief and weariness, Harry Kitten and Tucker Mouse crept under an iron fence, through a hedge, and fell asleep. They woke up together on, and on the dot, as usual. Just look at these lovely bushes, those trees, said Harry. Why, it's a protected little park. Protected from what? asked Tucker, who had noticed that, as well as the buried fence around the park. There was a gate, and it was locked. Only the people who lived nearby had, to, had a key to get in. Okay. Oh, you, you asked so many questions, said Harry. I repeat, if this part of New York was, is so nice, protected from what? Oh, from hoodlums and, and beggars and troublemakers. And also, I would guess, from horrible dogs who aren't on leashes. And from homeless kittens and mice, too, maybe. A park that this well, this well kept could even me, if, even me, feel like a hoodlum. And trying to find us a place to live. All right, okay. So we'll give it a try, but at least beats the docks. So for a while, one kitten and one mouse lived quietly in Good Ministry Park. So that's what the, it was called, very quietly. Because this park in the heart of, of New York City seemed to have a strict sort of upper-class hush about, about it. Not that there were, weren't children or older people, just seeing the sun and everyone was. They're so polite, said Tucker. You'd rather have rats, asked Harry, who was munching slowly to make it last. On half a roast beef sandwich, the meat was perfectly cooked, too. Not too rare, but not too well done. It must have come from a very offensive dynasty. Harry could not imagine how half a roast beef sandwich could have dropped and, forgot and, and forgotten it in, in Grants Me Park. No, I don't want rats, took her mouse. But I wouldn't mind a little action. Now give me a chomp on that roast beef. He glumbled furiously. Your manners, my word, Harry murmured disapprovingly. Tucker almost choked. We listen to, to a cane kitten here. You prove your manners a little bit more and like your fur three times a day. With a little luck, you could get adopted by the by one of those old women who come here and knit all afternoon. Would you like that, kittykins? Harry didn't reply. Yet, Grandma Surrey Park was a beautiful place. Tucker couldn't deny it. There were well-tined trees. There were flowers of all different colors. It was as if an overripe rainbow had burst and scattered its seeds over Grandma Surrey Park. The lawn was clipped as neat and nice as a new haircut. Clean benches were set here and there. And also, all around the square. There were lovely old buildings, townhouses, and they were... But there also was that high iron fence. Of course, animals could get... And through the bars, but even the animals, and especially the squirrels, had who's it manners. So Tucker and Harry, whose manners were not that exquisite or refined, had just slipped through the bars and found themselves in a very well mannered paradise. What little creatures were living there? A few well bred insects, especially were all of a very high class.
one praying mantis even nodded to Tucker that had and that had never happened before. Indeed, it was the very first time in New York and perhaps everywhere that a praying mantis had nodded cornly into a mouse. This is heaven, said Tucker. I got smiled at by a bug. But heaven, and would anyone believe this? Even heaven itself or a mouse ha has its disadvantages. A mouse gets nervous, especially when he almost gets run over by a baby carriage. One afternoon, a wee bit bored by nothing but leisure, in the idle beauty of Grand Center Park, Tucker Mouse ventured out on the sidewalk, just for a change. And he almost got squashed by a lovely yellow baby carriage, which was being wheeled by a nurse in a scorched white uniform. The nurse herself looked quite scorched, too. Harry, said Tucker, when he had returned to the Redonian bush. They were living under. Which way would you prefer? Do you match by, by a nurse in a stiff uniform or by a bone to the docks? What? asked Harry. Or how would you like to live in a life in a fantastic, f in fabulous corridors? Lowest level of the Empire State Building. Have you gone crazy? asked Harry. Very nearly, said Tucker. Harry sighed, and I thought I found you happiness. Happiness is fine, said Tucker, but I got to somehow have some action too. I mean, apart from baby carriages and flowers that never cease to bloom. Harry lay down and didn't purr. But he sort of moaned. Docks, skyscrapers, what do you want? I want life, excitement, shouted Tucker. Oh, excitement, life, mused Harry Kitten. Where is it? His eyes changed. A glaring, almost green glare came to him then. Harry, stop that, said Tucker. You don't need to, st be, to be go to go goofy. Hmm, Harry purred. Yes, life. And I know where it is. Where, squeaked Tucker, who was suddenly more like a kitten himself now. Times Square, said Harry, although his voice cracked. The, the crossroads of the whole city. I'm not sure I'm up to that, whimpered Tucker. You better be, commanded this little furry kitten. Harry Kitten, who sounded more like a Harry, Harry Cat. Is it dangerous? asked Tucker Mouse. Rolling his paws again? You bet, said Harry Cat. Tell me about it, pleaded Tucker Mouse. In the very center of this greatest city, in the very greatest country there is, is Times Square, the heart of the world. Harry, you, you are frightening me. The subway trains that they run on the ground in their candy stores and hamburger joints, and most of all, they are hurrying, rushing human beings. I'm not so keen on them, said Tucker. Don't worry, they won't even notice you. Well, a little bit of notice, said Tucker, would not be too offensive. And there are... I know this, because when I pro Times Square, I saw pipes, and I saw nieces, and I saw places to hide. But the people, Harry... The human beings who don't know, you don't think they hound us out? Harry shook his head. They're too much concerned with themselves, and we just keep out of the way of all the life that goes on there. Keeping out of the way of the of life, said Tucker? Is that way of life? Harry started to laugh, but Cookie stopped, for he saw that the moisture was dripping down. Tucker's, Tucker's furry cheeks. We have no place to live, moaned Tucker in a choked voice. And nobody wants us. Now, just a minute. Harry laid a paw on his small friend's back. In the first place, we want we want each other, so that makes t it takes care of that. And in the second, we like Times Square. You will like Times Square. Well, Harry, if you do, it might, I might like it too. Tucker's whiskers is very small. We're absolutely dripping now. A curious thing then took place. A kitten wiped a mouse's eyes. Neither one of them said a word. And the brush of those paws across those wet cheeks was the strangest touch. The most wonderful in the world. Should we give it a try? Asked Harry quietly. I guess so. Harry Tucker slipped a little. If you say so, Harry. And again there began the scuttle and struggle through the streets of New York. It was raining now, too. The kind of dull drizzle that everyone hates. Gray light hushed all the harsh silhouettes into the, into the dangerous city. But it was fortunate. On this special day... For a gray mouse and a kitten whose fur hadn't quite decided its color could pass almost unseen through the ugly gray streets of the city. The people in Times Square when Tucker and Harry reached it, safe, 
were too far too busy of wanting the drizzle to notice two shivering little creatures. Our luck, whispered Harry. So this is luck, mused Tucker Mouse, as a man with a blurring radio passed by. That penny must be a bust. Although he could remember 10th Avenue, Tucker had always avoided Times Square. That is, when he could, when the sanitation workers hadn't chased him in that direction. There was too much hustling and bustling there, too much pushing and shoving, and no mice and no niceness at all. There were people dashing everywhere and bumping each other and not caring a bit. They were all try trying desperately to, to just escape the drizzle, which had now turned to rain. I know there's a grilly in the street here somewhere that leads up down the subway, said Harry. The subway, wailed Tucker. Tucker. You'd rather get soaked in the rain and maybe bought by a portable radio? The subway, said Tucker, utterly de defeated. And how am I asked do you know about the subways? When I was a kitten, hmm, a lion already? I did some prowling late at night, and I'm sure that there was a great near here. Harry's eyes flashed left, right, everywhere. What is so safe? Tucker Mouse was shivering about the subway. It's dry and it's warm. Now you wash up. Now will you hush up? There are two very good reasons. Tucker wriggled his growling whiskers. There it is, shouted Harry. Over there, across the street. That grill on the sidewalk. What eyes do you have? Come on, but wait for the light. In the very small time it takes for a traffic light to change. A mouse and a cat had dashed across 42nd Street and vanished through a grill in the, con in the concrete. They were just small enough to fit. And then they were gone. Gone underground to the strange but lively ruin of Times Square at subway station. Isn't it wonderful? said Harry, awestruck. He gazed at the stores for some of the subway stations in New York have stores in them. But at the lunch counters and newspaper stands, but oh, those neon lights. Red, green, blue, rainbow of colors, they were, but they were a fantastic name in him most. I'm scared, said Tucker, who wasn't so quite fascinated. I'd never been in a place like this before. It's marvelous. Sure, marvelous, but where do we live? That remains to be seen. Discovered. I mean, I know the way in, but, but... I don't know the layout. Let's explore. I've heard that before, said Tucker Mouse. But exploring they went. Late at night, after hiding behind a trash can which most of the humans had been darkly used, and when most of the comm commuters had pushed and crammed their way into the subway cars to get home. The, the station was more quiet then. They could do a little prowling in safety. Harry was still betwitched by all the place. And Tucker had begun to be a little, little twitched to himself. Especially by the smells that came from the lunch counters. They made his mouth water. It might, I might be happy here, Harry, after all. The mouse admitted breezily. So it might be both, said Harry. But we've got to find a place of our own. A private place. Like a home, you mean? Exactly, a home. It got late, and then later, the people riding the subway grew fewer and fewer. Their goaders. Theater goers, mostly yawning their way their long way home. And still, no special place for a kitten and a mouse. Let's go near the shuttle, said Harry. What's that? I think it's just a little short train that goes from Times Square and to some place near. Beside the shuttle tracks, there was some kind of run-down newsstand, all buried up for a night, but it had a friendly look. We can get in there, said Tucker. Time to take at the tracks in those boards. Whoever owns it will open up in the morning. Then what? Tucker sat on his haunches and said, So Times Square subway station, another no place to live. But Harry, whose eyes were sharper than Tucker's, had been glancing through the gloom. He thought he saw, was it? Yes, it was. A black opening in the wall. There's a hole over there. Big deal, a hole. Come on, let's look. The big was the hole was big and filthy. Yuck! What a mess, said Tucker. It could be cleaned, and also I don't think too many people will know about this hole. It's a very negellid hole. And it smells. It's moldy, Harry. Shh. Why shh? 
There's nobody here, and no one would want to be. I said, shush, Terry ordered. The trucker heard it too. There was a faint splashing somewhere in back. A lake too. Shh. Harry crept to the back of the hole, and even in the dim light that filtered in for the subway, he could see where a trickle, a trickle of light was, of water was falling. It's clean, he explained. Come take a bath. I don't want a bath. You need a bath, and this water it must be a leak from a cupboard pipe. Clean water in a subway hole. A true miracle. Now come in here, and we'll get clean, too. Tucker sputtered, and Harry laughed. And in a few minutes, after all their wandering through New York, the dirt they collected, inevitable for Varagods, had all been washed away. They let the, the, they let the drifting air then dry them off. And the air wasn't dirty, either. It filtered in very softly through the opening of the hole. Many minutes went by. Then Harry said, Tucker Mouse, this is our home. He heaved the biggest sigh he has ever heard from a growling kitten. It'll take a lot of cleaning. Oh, Tucker, Harry said, we're here at last. Well, maybe you'll feel more like home when we spruce up a little. It feels pretty good to me already. And also when I get my, my collection. Harry's eyes widened. My good collection? Well, I don't have it yet, said Tucker early, but I intend to form a collection. A collection of what? Why? Why of everything? And I'll start with my penny. And the one I left on my on 10th Avenue. Do you mean to tell me, Harry's for a prickled, that you're going to go all the way back to 10th Avenue to retrieve one penny? I am indeed, said Tucker. This is one mouse. Those that know is the value of a cent. And besides, it may have been the luck in that penny that found us this place. A living with a crazy mouse. Harry shook his head. And if you can get all the way to 10th Avenue and then back here again, say if it won't be luck, it'll be another miracle. So you have your miracle with running clean water, and then I'll have mine with pennies, he grinned. As a new thought crossed his mind. And also, on, on, and maybe also nickels and dimes and many other uh, other delightful things. But we had to clean this place out first. No collection of mine shall be in your house in the dump. To work, then, said Harry. To work, said, Tuck, said Tucker. If they had been men, they have rolled up their sleeves. But you can't roll up fur that's growing on you. So they went just went to work. And that work took many days or rather many nights. For they found it much safer to work at night. When the subway was also just almost deserted, they threw out chips and chunks of platter, little bits of concrete, and left the, and also, and also, left, also left over human trash, the like grime banana peel that had somehow found its way into a hole. You know, said Harry when they were resting, exhausted one night. I think this was a drip drain pipe once that they uh, that all got sucked up. Do you think those watermarks there? Let's hope that we don't clean it out so well. That the flood comes crashing down from the street. Oh, we won't, said Harry. It stopped up for good, except for my delightful shower. That comes from a different set of pipes, I'm sure. And speaking of delightful things, said Tucker, tomorrow I'll go for my penny. Harry sighed. All right, if we must. Not we. I. Tucker. I will not let you go alone. I may still be a kitten, but I'm almost a cat, and... Harry, said Tucker Mouse, proud. I, too, am growing up, and this deed I must do alone. Harry narrowed his eyes and looked at his friend, and when he, quit, when he quit saw silenced him, he looked away. If you must, I must. Next night, a new moon hung the sky, hung high above the skyscrapers of New York. It seemed like a little silver grin. Tucker and Harry came up to the sidewalk. By now, they, had, they knew many secret ways there. A sweet wind from the west had swept the city clean. You're really going to do it? asked Harry. I really am, said Tucker. So long. Be back in a flash. And the mouse was gone. Harry strained to get the last goods of him. Nothing. The kitten, who felt like a kitten now. Along with lone, alone and lonely, went to their home. Their home. He he wondered, or it was only his, his alone. He curled and uncurled his little times, but sleep would not come. 
Blade travels hurry by, and they too, most of them, were worried. As if they also had problems that might not be resolved. Poor human beings, poor animals, thought Harry, sign. A young man took a token and then couldn't find it. He said he said very nasty words. But Harry saw where he had landed. He rushed out and pulled and pushed the token right next to the young man's feet. Hey, wow, the, the man shouted. You are some cat. He was wearing a fuzzy blue breast. Thanks, catkins. But, Curry, but Harry hurried back to his home where he waited and waited and waited and waited. And while he was waiting, he worry grew heavier and heavier until a plank side in the drain pipe. Here's the penny. You found it and got back. I think it should be. Tucker glanced around above the mantelpiece. Just casually, he threw in. I did have trouble with that sanitation truck. Those big wheels, you know. Ah, well, I think I'd do the mantelpiece. Except we have no mantelpiece. His eyes wandered here and, here and there. How about, about the entrance into the drain pipe? Great. Harry looked around and blinked. Just great. You put it in there. Though it's yours. It is ours, said Tucker. He placed the penny carefully on a little edge of stone that stood above, above the drain pipe opening. There. Now that's the beginning. And indeed a beginning it was, for now Tucker Mouse truly knew that collecting things, scrounging, he called it, was his vaca vocation. And vocation is, is what and what is what human beings call their life's work. He was very lucky, Tucker was. In small change, apart from pennies, he found a few knuckles in one uh, and on one glorious afternoon, a quarter, the bliss of it, he crooned. But as, as well as cash, he also found funny human things, like a lady's crazy hat, droopy and blue, with a vivid pink feather. Hey, look at that. I'm looking, said Harry. It's very ordinary. Ordinary is nice, said Tucker Mouse. And all the time that the Tucker Mouse had been collecting, scrounging. Harry had been slinking and watching and observing the subway station, and wisely he observed it all. He observed that there was one man who had a red necktie who always made his train if he wore that red necktie, and if he didn't wear it, he lost. The door closed on his face. His luck is in his necktie. Harry thought, maybe. Harry Cat deserved a lot, and thought, and thought. So what are you looking for Sir Gloomy so far? said Tucker. One night, he was especially happy that night, he found two dimes. <coughs> there are others living here besides us two, said Harry Cat. If you don't believe me, just look across the, the tracks. Tucker looked. Six eyes, two by two, were staring at them. Who are they? Rats. And worse than most miserable creatures we've met in the docks. Rats? And they're big. They live in garbage cans and they're looking at us. Just jealous, said Tucker. Maybe, said Harry. But I want to go very big fast. You've been busy, so busy collecting. You haven't seen the eyes. Just look at them. <coughs> Across the subway tracks, those eyes of three rats, steely, greedy, and st all stared at Tucker and Harry. And garbage cans. Who would live there? Someone hungry. Tucker tried to make the best of it. Who has no place to live. You and I weren't doing so well with us ourselves for a while. We never sucked to garbage cans. Harry grumbled to it in his throat. I just don't like the look of those eyes. I like the man who with the red necktie. And I like the lady who's, who's only wears sneakers. But I don't like those eyes. They've been staring at us for days now. They have? I'll say. And those guys are big too. Well, you keep an eye on those eyes, said Tucker. I'm sure we'll be all right. I wonder, said Harry. And secretly, although he put on a brave face, Tucker too began to worry. He had grown out so fond of his, of his collection, the buttons and bits of ribbon, not to mention the, the money. The thought of anyone preying on them made his fur bristle. In the course of the next few days, Tucker's worry grew and grew. He finally had to talk about it. Harry, he said one day, one night, you don't think those rats would steal my anything from my collection? They might. But why? I only collect the things I like, and even the money. I just like to look at all those lovely dimes, and sometimes roll around in them. So who is harmed if every no, 
Oh, and, and then I take a nickel rinse. But rats don't like beautiful things. What good they, would they be to the, them anyway? I'll give you an example, said Harry. Remember what you found yesterday? Tucker sighed. Just costume jewelry, but gorgeous. Yes, well, a rat could steal that pin and drop it in, well, one of the lunch counters. And while the waitresses are fighting over who found it first, he could eat up a pound of hamburger. Oh dear, Tucker run his front paws. They would use my treasures. You bet they would. Because rats are users, and they have no sense of beauty at all. Now Tucker's worry turned to panic. He was so panic-stricken that he almost stopped collecting completely. And not if an especially closed item like a lady's hairpin that just having to fall outside the drain pipe opening. The days wore on, and six days started, and then six eyes started. And Tucker Mouse thought he just had might lose his mouse mind. But even he had had to sleep sometimes. He woke up one night, it was very late, and saw Harry staring into the subway. Is something wrong? He jumped onto his feet. I thought I heard something. The raid. Tucker House also did not have time to ask what. The raid was upon them. However, it didn't feel like a raid at first. Hi, guys, said the biggest rat. Biggest rat. I thought we ought to get acquainted. Oh, delighted to, said Harry Cat, and flashed a wearing glass at Tucker. The strangest thing about these rats was they all looked alike. One was huge and one was middle sized, and one might be a little though, although he was at least twice as big as Tucker Mouse. Their fur was kind of dirty gray, and there was dirt on it. But their eyes, oh, their eyes, were identical sharp, fierce, piercing, and full of malice. I'm Chloe, said the biggest rat. I assume that means Charlie, said Harry Cat. Yes, Chloe means Chloe. And said Chloe Rat. And this is Spud. He pointed a claw at the middle sized rat. So, so called because potatoes is favorite food. And Durant is the bump. For the reason that lose at the end of his nose. The bump had a, ner had a nervous laugh. If one could call it a laugh, it was more like a, a high queer shriek. Yeah, the bump on the bump, he squealed with delight. I wish I wouldn't do that, said Tucker. It's very upsetting. So, up so upset, said the bump. We all got our problems. His mad laughter flirted insanely again. I'm not happy, Harry, Tucker said to his friend. Why, said Chloe, it's just friendly call. Yeah, so us guys can get to know you guys, said Spud. Tucker shot at Harry a nervous look. In fact, I am very unhappy, Harry. You notice how nice the little mouse smells, said Chloe to Spud. It took a I took a shower before retiring tonight, said Tucker. In the practice, I certainly urge all you three to adopt. This embark brought forth the wildest good giggling yet from a bump. By now, inch by inch, the rats had edged their way into the drain pipe. Tucker and Harry found themselves backed against one wall. So, a mouse and a kitten living together, said Chloe. A very strange combination. I'm not a kitten, said Harry, which is which was more convincing than they could. I'm a cat. You still are a kitten, the kitten's little whiskers. Chloe flipped Harry's whiskers with one claw, then flipped his own. Whereas these are the whiskers of a fully grown rat. Well, it's been nice to meet you, squeaked Tucker. If there's ever anything you should need, like a shower. <coughs> need, said Chloe, and glint of teeth appeared behind an evil smile. We don't need nothing, but there is something we want. The sound that came from his mouth was part snarl, part growl, and part hiss. We want what, what, what we've been seeing you raking, you raking this hole, my little fur, fr freaky furry friend, and we and we're gonna get. It. So we don't fight. I don't argue. Just hand over what you got. My life, my life savings. Street Tucker, if that what you call loot, yeah, the life savings. I will not. And shivering though he was, a bit from the dampness still in his fur, since he had tried himself too well earlier. 
Tricker Mouse stamped his foot. No, never. Yeah, you will, said Chloe in a quiet, dimly kind of voice as a board, as if the whole awful transcendent had already been completed, or else I'll hold you ever very bad. And then take the stuff away. And that, Harry Cat blew up. I told you, he shouted, Tucker, these are bums. They plan to dine just to bite someone's leg who was picking it up. Not a bad idea, chuckled Chloe Lat. The, t the the Katie's got a sense of humor. And by the way, we we be back every month to check collect what you have picking up in the meantime. No, now Harry too spoke quietly, although his voice broke a little since Chloe was right. He wasn't a cat yet. No, you will not. You will not take one item of my friend's possessions. And furthermore, you will leave these permissions which are home, which is our home, right now. And you will go back to whatever your filthy whichever filthy garbage can you call your home your home. For a moment, Chloe Rat just stared at his W little kitten, whose fur was still fuzzy, and who had challenged him, given him, Chloe Rat in order to go. And for the for that moment did Lloyd quite stare. They lunged at Harry and sank his tedious sharp teeth in the kitten's shoulder. Harry screamed as a cat can scream. Not simply yowl, but the pain was horrible. But Tucker didn't scream. He roared. A, fe a real war for a very small mouse. Then he went to Chloe and bit his tail. Ow! Ow! And the rat, and the la and the rat let go of Harry. Tucker bit in deeper. Chloe bearded all his teeth, and Tucker knew that, for him at least, the fight was over. He might as well be dead. But he wasn't dead, because once those fangs were out of his shoulder, Harry jumped in on Chloe's back and started clawing. At best he could with claws, they weren't yet grown. Meanwhile, the other two rats had been gawking. They couldn't believe that a kitten and a mouse would bite back. And particularly at their boss, Chloe Rat, but now they, but they, now they knew what to join the battle, too. They had to help Chloe, because if they didn't, he skinned them alive. A frenzy, a frantic, like a furious chaos of claws, paws, teeth, tails now occurred. No one was winning, but suddenly Chloe Rat shouted, HOLD IT! In the fury, the, in the fury of the fighting and the scratching and the biting, the whole situation ended like this. Harry Kitten, who was now defending Harry Cat, had managed to flatten Chloe. The rat lay on his back, and Harry swallowed all over him. And Tucker Mouse, with the tiny insect that fall that small particular people have, had raised one small but very short claw above Chloe's tender nose. Stop! Stop! Shouted Chloe. Oh, oh, my nose! Where stop? Tucker said for a mouse. Was he? He suddenly felt very strong. And you better, and you better tell your friends to go home. Otherwise, it was horrible, but they saved their home. Otherwise, I'm going to claw a good gold in your nose. And he only hoped that his claws were big enough to carry out his threat. Go on, you guys. Will remember Cooley Rat? He didn't sound one single bit from his form of bragging and blustering himself. Go on. Back to the glitch. Gibbets can. My nose. Oh. Oh, wow, said the bump, who hadn't said a single word till then. And I thought I was a coward. He tittered again. The bump and spud backed down the drain pipe. Very gingerly, Harry and Tucker let Chloe go, and went fast, out of the shame as well pain. Neither mouse nor cat had the strength to speak. For at least five minutes, there was only a relief. Peace. Harry, he said they'd be back in a month. Tucker Mouse finally had found the breath to say, now "Don't worry, Harry Cat had the lawn since realized the best way, the only way to get the quiet his friend was to flatten him gently on the floor with a paw, claws in. With with all the lunch stands here, I'll be able to eat a lot. And in one month, he reared up on his hind legs and showed off his growing muscles. In one just." In just one month, I'll be so big that all those rats in New York will tremble, most of all those hooligans. Very impressive, I must say, said Tucker, who knew that for the rest of his life, he would always be a mouse. And by the way, Harry tapped Tucker's head, mousekins, you saved my life. 
by biting that nasty creature's tail. Yes, and you saved my life saving, said Tucker. Harry Cat had to laugh at that. And it wasn't more than just a purring murmur of the cat's delight. It was more like the howling murmur, the, the howling of Bjorf, and happiness, and safety, and home. And of course, they're equally important, my life, and your life savings, that is. Oh, Harry, I didn't mean, but Tucker was abruptly distracted, as blast of silver fell at his feet. Come on, Master Mouse, I was only kidding. Look, Harry. At a, at a certain hour of the night of rain and moonlight, if the moon was full, fell through a grating above in Times Square, and felt like a silent poem, a prayer, in front of the drain pipe where Harry and Tucker now lived. They both looked at the silvery light, and then they went out to get, to get the feel out of it on their backs. The moonlight made the fur of both animals shine, as it felt as if they were shining inside them too. Tucker Mouse was silent, and then he coughed. The light stillness of the subway station so beautiful and difficult just had to be broken. And then it was really broken, harshly. A clattering train rushed in. One man ran to catch it and made it. A lady cried. Oh, please wait. The man for the held a door open for her. Oh, thank you. She, she said, the, tr the train sped away. I'm glad she caught it, murmured Tucker. But Harry said nothing. He shone. This has been a Benjamin Steele's production of Harry Kitten and Tucker Mouse by George Selden. Pictures by Garth Williams. Read for you by Stuart Heyman. This book was copyrighted, was, was copyrighted in 1986 by George Selden. Production copyright 2022 by Benjamin Sears Publishers. All rights reserved.